I'm here to welcome you to uh, the session called Getting Teacher Evaluation Right. It is indeed a challenge for policymakers. And I can tell by the size of the crowd that everybody understands the, the scope of the challenge that policymakers are facing. Uh, this is a session that is co-sponsored by the American Education Research Association and the National Academy of Education. Uh, my name is Jack Jennings and I'm with the uh, Center on Education Policy and I'll be the moderator for this session. But first, uh, let us thank Senator Udall for giving us the room and Ryan Deal for his administrative assistant for arranging all the administrative details of getting everything done uh, to make this occur. Well, this issue is, is quite a, a hot issue, as you know. Uh, the critics of teacher evaluation, I think, have made a pretty good case that what we've been operating on for years is not working very well, and that uh, it does need to be replaced with something better. The, the policy dilemma is trying to create something better, especially if you tie student test scores into that equation and try to use student uh, test scores as a factor to evaluate teachers. And so uh, what we're going to discuss today uh, is uh, that issue and a, a number of other related issues, all with the objective of trying to inform the conversation so that we can understand better in creating a new system how uh, we can fairly evaluate teachers, we can correctly evaluate teachers, and we can do it with the objective that we get a better teaching force than we have today so that education is improved. So let me tell you what we will do. We have four presenters. And these presenters are uh, the cream of the crop. Uh, you're getting some of the best people, I think, in education research. And they will uh, make short presentations. Everybody's agreed to about a 10-minute uh, presentation so that we can have some discussion. Uh, the first presenter, and you have all the bios, I think, in your materials. So uh, uh, the first presenter will be Ed Hartle. Uh, Ed, as you know, is uh, at Stanford. Uh, he heads the National Research Council's Board on Testing and Assessment and has done many other things, none of which I will get into because you have all the detail with you. Uh, then we will follow with Jesse, Jesse Rothstein, and uh, he is at uh, Berkeley. But the interesting part of his background, I find, is that he uh, was a senior economist with the Council for Economic Advisors in the Executive Office of the President. And so he brings some pretty deep uh, knowledge to this issue. Uh, the, the third presenter will be Audrey uh, uh, Beardsley, uh, who's at Arizona State University, and uh, she has done uh, some work looking at teacher evaluation in practice and is going to be able to help us understand a little better exactly what's happening as uh, the nation tries to deal with uh, creating a better system. Uh, the last presenter will be Linda Darling Hammond. And Linda is one of these people who does not deserve or does not need an introduction. Uh, she, <laughs> I think this is the last time I'll be a moderator. Uh, Linda, in fact, is a professor at Stanford. Uh, she has such a, a long background. Uh, I knew her when she was with uh, the Rand Corporation many years ago. And uh, she's done many things in the meantime. If there's somebody I would point to as having deep knowledge about teacher education, preparation of teachers, I think it would be Linda. So she will uh, make the last presentation. Then we have two reactors. Uh, the first reactor is uh, Bethany Little, who is a senior our chief education counsel to the majority, to Senator Harkin. And uh, she has a distinguished background. I won't go into that either. But our, our last reactor uh, will be uh, uh, Lindsay uh, Hunsicker, and she is not here, and Bethany tells me that she's 37 weeks pregnant, or, and so we're not sure she's going to be here this morning, <laughs> but she may have something to do that takes priority over our, our discussion. So let us start with Ed, and then uh, we'll go to our presenters, our respondents, and then uh, have a general discussion. Thanks very much, Jack. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, Jack Jennings has said, <clears throat> you all know there's been a lot of attention and a lot of controversy for obvious reasons around the use of value-added models for teacher evaluation. And what 
the two organizations we represent, AERA and the National Academy of Education, can bring to this conversation is a hard look at the empirical evidence. A lot of the policy talk sometimes strays away from what we actually know based on actual research findings. And we, in our opinion, the research is actually pretty one-sided. So we're hoping that laying out what we know about value-added models and also about some of the alternative ways of, of uh, conducting teacher evaluation for different purposes will help to clear the air and will help to encourage the formulation of wise policy so we can all work for what we all want, which is the improvement of American education. In our presentations this morning, I hope to clarify some of the pluses and minuses of these approach of of value-added models in particular. Professor Rothstein will elaborate on that. Professor Amrine Beardsley will elaborate some of what we know looking at how these models have actually played out in practice. And then Professor Darling Hammond will speak primarily to some of the alternatives to the value-added models. Uh, value-added models are designed to show how much achievement value teachers add to their students over the, over the course of a school year. There are some old ideas here, but with some new terminology and some new twists. A lot of the factors that influence students, there are a lot of different factors that influence students' test scores. Some of these are random and some are not. Random factors are unpredictable. They average out to zero. That's the important thing. Uh, in other words, they wash out when we average across a lot of students. The non-random factors are things that on average will lean towards some teachers against other teachers. And those are things that persist even when we average across students' test scores. So what a value-added model has to do is disentangle the effects of the teacher from all these other non-random factors, some but not all of which are, are reflected in the student's prior achievement. I'm going to start with just a couple of assumptions here. And as with all kinds of models and all kinds of assumptions, there's a lot of truth in, in where we start. The problem is just pushing some of these obvious truths a little too far. First, we can all agree that some teachers are better than others. But that's not the same as saying that each teacher can be described by a single number that captures his or her effectiveness year after year with one classroom full of students after another, and that can be estimated from students' test scores and used to predict future performance accurately. Likewise, we can all agree that students' standardized test scores measure some important schooling outcomes. But that's not the same as saying that brief, inexpensive tests can locate students on some simple equal interval achievement scale. It's very difficult, in fact, to take two scores from a year apart on two different tests aligned to different grade level content standards and use those two scores to figure out how much a student has learned over the course of the year. This is a kind of an apples to oranges comparison. And while psycho psychometricians, I'm a psychometrician, sometimes we're a bit arrogant about what we can accomplish, but building vertical scales that allow us to make these kinds of comparisons across time really is a very difficult technical challenge, especially so when we try to retrofit a vertical scale to pre-existing tests. I saw a simplified explanation of value-added models that used an analogy of two gardeners growing oak trees. That presentation was fine as far as it went, but it glossed over some really big problems, some of which are listed here. Think how easy it is to measure the height of a tree or the volume of liquid in a test tube compared to measuring student achievement. Value, variables like height or weight or value, volume and so forth are, are one-dimensional. They're easily measured with equal-sized units. Trees don't influence one another's growth, and test tubes don't talk to one another. But one child with an emotional behavioral disability can influence the learning of an entire classroom full of students. Uh, also, there's no way for a gardener to focus on increasing tree height at the expense of, say, trunk diameter. But in the classroom, if only reading and math are measured, the teacher can focus on those things that ignore history and science. Uh, let me return to the logic of sorting out teacher effects. First of all, as noted, teachers don't all begin the school year at the same point. Initial achievement varies as a function of these factors. You can probably think of others as well. Over the course of a school year, many of these same factors responsible for initial differences continue to operate, influencing the rate of learning. In addition, of course, students' achievement gains are influenced by the instruction they receive. Research suggests that the classroom teacher is the most important within-school factor affecting student achievement. 
But this is not the same thing as saying the teacher effects are more powerful than out-of-school factors. Let me say that again. Teachers are the most powerful in-school influence on student learning, but that's not the same thing as saying the teacher effects trump out-of-school factors. Also, while teachers are one very important within-school factor, the teacher is not the only factor in determining the effectiveness of instruction. Evaluated model results depend heavily on what variables are included in the equations they use. Some of the influences listed here might be accounted for by variables like prior test scores or school fixed effects, but others will not be. Moreover, many of these factors are partially under the teacher's control, but not completely. So saying what should be in the statistical model and what shouldn't be is, is a problem, and it's not always clear. Some things are kind of partly in and partly out. The main point here is that controlling for prior year scores is not sufficient. Um, test scores are fuzzy. They fluctuate, they fail to pick up a lot of important learning, and they're affected by sources of invalidity like drilling kids and test wiseness strategies. In addition, just because students have the same score last year or even the same score as the past couple of years doesn't mean they're on the same trajectory. Even if two students had identical mastery over last year's content, that would not they would not necessarily have the same preparation for learning this year's content. Uh, up until now, I focused on the logic of value-added models and I've raised some questions. I'd like next to turn to some studies that can show us whether the problems I've mentioned are serious or not. Professor Jesse Rothstein will, pre will be presenting some additional evidence and elaborating on some of these concerns. You'll recall my first oversimplifying assumption pertained to the notion that effectiveness was a stable teacher characteristic. That's addressed by evidence concerning the stability of effectiveness estimates, the first bullet. Second, my second simplifying assumption had to do with the power of brief inexpensive tests to locate students along a one-dimensional achievement scale. Since these tests are fundamental drivers of any value-added model, it's really important to look at them very closely. Um, I probably a possibly unhelpful aside, um, in my experience, uh, academics from some other disciplines sometimes think that test scores can be used like variables like dollars, say, or that, that have simple properties that are well understood. And in fact, test scores are much, much slippery, much more slippery entities, and there are a lot of problems with using scores in some of the ways that have been proposed. Uh, my third bullet, random assignment, refers to a strong and important assumption required by these models. Uh, Professor Rossi will have more to say about this in a few minutes. And finally, I've included just two quotes from experts, which are a sample from the Economic Policy Institute briefing on which Linda darling Hammond and I were among the 10 co-authors. That briefing is included in the packets for this morning. Turning into this first topic, the stability of effectiveness estimates, this question asks whether evaluated model estimates are reliable. Now, it's sometimes said that unreliability in the middle of the scale doesn't matter much because we're interested in identifying extreme cases. But in fact, research shows that these model estimates are, if anything, less accurate for teachers in the tails of the distribution. In a paper published last year, Professor Shosha Newton, Linda Darling Hammond, Ewer Thomas, and I took advantage of a large data set constructed for another project to compare teachers' value-added scores across different value-added model specifications across different courses the same teacher was taking, and also across successive years of instruction with different classes. We started out quite optimistic in this project. We were bullish on the use of these value-added models to tease out the effectiveness of teachers, and then wanted to relate these empirically determined effectiveness estimates to other qualities of the teacher's instruction, which came in the context of this larger study from careful study of, of classroom observations and, and other sources of information about their prior preparation and so on. So in this model, we ranked teachers and grouped them into 10 deciles in different ways and then compared the results. This slide shows how much teacher effectiveness estimates bounced around. And from these numbers, uh, we were forced to conclude that any simple notion of effectiveness is a stable, enduring quality of individual teachers simply did not hold up to careful scrutiny. In this, uh, I think we shared our disappointment with that and many other researchers who've gone down the same path. 
This is a particularly dramatic case from the Newton et al. study showing how an experienced high school teacher received wildly different effectiveness ratings teaching the same course to two groups of students, even with statistical controls for school and for student demographics, in addition to statistical controls for prior year test scores. The year one class included higher proportions of low-income Hispanic and English learner students. And with that class, the teacher's effectiveness ranking was at the bottom of the distribution. The next year, with a more advantaged class, it was at the top. The message here is that the statistical controls simply did not work. Uh, turning to my second topic here, I'll show you just two released items from the California standards tests, one each from history and algebra. Uh, before each item, I'll show you the standard that it was supposed to measure. I have many examples like this, and I could easily find examples from other states that would nail home the same message as well. In the interest of time, just these two will serve to make the point. Here's a U.S. history standard for 11th graders. I'm sorry the text is so small. The standard says to discuss the significant domestic policy speeches of various presidents on a variety of different important policy topics. For now, though, just notice the verb discuss. Next, here's the item. We know that, and it's a multiple choice item, so there can't really be discussion, but what this item actually calls for is just paired associate learning. A chart with rows for each president, columns for each policy area, and names of programs in the cells would be all a teacher would need to nail any item for, of this kind for this objective. Turning to algebra, since these are multiple choice items, you know students won't be constructing or formulating anything, but still, I'm sorry, naming the procedure is just not the same as doing the math. The Park and SBAC assessment tests are going to be better than the ones we have now. The ones we have now, in many ways, aren't all that bad. Smart, thoughtful people have built the tests we have. Just saying we need better tests is not going to do any good. That's been tried again and again. The teachers we have now are good for some purposes. The consortium tests should be much better but they're not going to be good enough that we should make turning, getting high scores on these tests into the de facto goal of schooling. The tests will be better, they're not going to be good enough for that. Turning to this third bullet, conditionally random assignment of students to teachers is a critical assumption in value-added models. Depending on the exact model and the interpretations intended, conditionally random assignment of teachers to schools may also be required. Random assignment is critical because some students are harder to teach than others. If students were randomly assigned to teachers, then those student differences would add noise, but using more data per teacher would go a long way toward fixing the problem. In other words, if these effects for different teachers averaged out to zero for each teacher, then you know, when we average across more teachers, they, they tend to wash out. The problem, though, is that some teachers get more than their share of hard to teach students again and again. Assignment of students to teachers is not random, and this problem then is one of systematic error. Measurement ex experts would talk about this as a problem of bias, not a problem of imprecision. It's a problem of validity, not a problem of reliability. This bias doesn't go away when you average across more teachers, I mean, you average across more students, excuse me. It gives a systematic advantage year after year, class after class, to teachers in some schools who are working with some kinds of students, and a systematic disadvantage to others. There's much better documentation of the non-random assignment of teachers to schools, and just as some students are harder to teach than others, some schools are harder to teach in than others. On my next slides, I have just two quotes that appeared in this Economic Policy Institute brief I mentioned before. I strongly agree with these quotes, but I do want to acknowledge here that the field is not quite unanimous on these questions. A few respected methodologists go further than most in supporting value-added model use for teacher evaluation. If you read the fine print and look at all of the caveats, then you find that actually there's not as much disagreement as it might appear at first blush. But um, I've been around this business long enough, I'm tired of hearing people say that un in, unlike our predecessors, we do not intend for any unintended consequences. First quote, 2003 RAND research report, Dan McCaffrey, Dan Koritz, J.R. Lockwood, and Laura Hamilton had this to say, since 2003, much more research evidence has accumulated. It's continued to show the same problems as were found in the earlier studies. 
In, the 2000, in 2009, the National Research Council's Board on Testing and Assessment issued a letter report directed to Secretary Arne Duncan commenting on the department's proposed race to the top fund. That letter urged strong cautions concerning evaluated models, strongly urged further research and pilot studies before mandating any operational use. I should mention that as chair of BOTA, I was involved in the preparation of that letter report. And since that report was issued, the evidence has continued to accumulate that, and again, it's been consistent that these models have serious problems. In closing, teacher effectiveness estimates with statistical controls for prior achievement are better than estimates based on unadjusted end-of-year student test scores. And they may be of real value if used appropriately, but they're not magic, and I believe they're being seriously oversold. I can still hear a teacher I met over 20 years ago saying these words. I have a great fear that thoughtless implementation or over-reliance on test score-based teacher evaluation models may underline the undermine the education of our most vulnerable children. Thank you. I am going to quickly review some, of, some evidence that underlies some of the claims that Ed made, uh, mostly evidence that's been uncovered in the last few years. And all, most of this evidence is about the properties of these value-added models, not about what happens when you use them mostly because we just don't have any evidence yet about what happens when you use these models in high-stakes settings. But the, the properties tell us a lot about what we should expect, and we have lots of experience in other fields that I'll talk about that tell us a, bit, a lot about what we should expect. So I'm going to talk about four important facts about value-added that we've learned that, that, that have been found in study after study, and that, that all four of them cut against the, the use of value-added in a simple-minded, high-stakes uh, uh, system. The first fact is that these estimates are extremely noisy, that luck matters an enormous amount to whether a teacher is, is found to be effective or ineffective, matters in almost all cases more than the teacher's actual effectiveness. A second, the second fact is that a teacher's estimated effectiveness depends a lot on which test the students are given, that, that if you give kids one test, teacher A looks effective, if you give kids another test, teacher A looks terrible and teacher B looks effective. Um, these are typically studies where we don't have any strong reason to think that one test is, is better than the, others, than the other. The third result is that the short-term effects that value-added models are meant to estimate effects on the scores at the end of this year, those effects really don't persist very long at all, and in, in many cases are reversed a year later. So that a teacher who's very effective for this year's score may be very ineffective for, for getting the kids to do better in the long run. And a fourth result is that, it is that value added estimates reward teachers importantly for which students they get as well in, in addition to or instead of which, how well they do with those students. The models are supposed to solve this problem that different teachers teach different types of students, but they, they manifestly don't solve the problem. So let me go through some of the evidence on this. This is from a, a recent study, um, a recent review, summary of the, of the evidence. This, this is based on five Florida school districts where teachers were assigned a grade A through F in year one, and then they were assigned a grade A through F in the year two. And you can look and see whether the A teachers this year were also the A teachers next year, which is what you would expect if, if, a, if the grade is actually capturing the teacher's effectiveness. What you see is that a teacher who gets an A this year is somewhat more likely to get an A next year than a teacher who, who got, say, an F this year, but not a whole lot more likely. And if you break it down, it, it turns out that a quarter of the teachers who got an A this year get a D or an F next year. Almost half of them get a C or lower. 30% of teachers who get an F this year get an A or a B next year. Half of them get a C or better. This is, this is just noise. That, that's how much noise is in these, in, in these systems. You can't really take very seriously a grade any particular year, and it's going to look awfully, awfully bad for your system if, you, if teachers' grades bounce around that much. And in fact, we've seen this in a few studies where teachers were given grades over and over again that they started out believing in the system, and after a couple years where they bounce around from an A one year to a D the next year to a B the next year, they start to think, you know, this system is junk, and they, and they lose all faith in it. And, um, and I think that that's something that we just have to be, have to be prepared to expect. These, these estimates are extremely noisy. Even averaging over a few years, which has been proposed to solve this problem, doesn't, doesn't go very far towards solving the problem unless you're going to wait 10 years or something like that, and that's not very useful. A second, second now, now let me move on to issues other than noise. I think noise is an extremely important issue, but let's set, set aside the noise. Imagine that we, could, we had thousands and thousands of students for every teacher and we could get rid of the noise problem. Another issue that, that has come up over and over again is the, the question of whether value-added models are measuring a teacher's effectiveness or whether they're, doing, they're in fact measuring what the teacher emphasizes. Um, 
the, these models are based on a view of education where there's only one dimension of student achievement. There's only one dimension of teacher effectiveness. Any decent test that we have is going to measure that achievement and is going to measure the effectiveness, and it doesn't really matter what we choose. In fact, that does, that's not the reality. It turns out to matter enormously which test you use. So one recent study conducted by the Gates Foundation uh, as part of their Measures of Effective Teaching uh, project, they found that, that if you take the teachers who are in the top quartile in terms of their estimated impacts on the state test, set aside all the noise concerns, imagine you had an infinitely large sample of students, and then look at the at value added of those teachers for, a, for an alternative test that's designed to be more conceptually demanding. So a test that doesn't just ask you to name the procedure, but actually ask you to, to implement things. Only about 20 to 30 percent of the teachers who are in the top quartile on the, on the state test are in the top half on the alternative test. So it looks like there's, there, there are some teachers who are very good for state tests and other teachers who are very good for, for the more conceptually demanding tests, and they're not the same set. Another result found that if you look at the same test and look at different subscores, so for example, a math test might have a procedure subscore and a problem solving subscore, a teacher's estimated effectiveness, test for, estimated effectiveness for one subscore is not very closely related with the effectiveness for another subscore. A third, a third result is that um, teachers' effects on high stakes tests are only somewhat related to their effects on low stakes tests. And even more worryingly, the high stakes effects fade out much more quickly than the low stakes effects. So if, since fade out, if, if a result fade, if an effect fades out very quickly, that might suggest that what we're picking up is the extent to which the teacher is teaching to the test. Rather than, rather than the extent to which the teacher is really encouraging students to learn something. If we see that the, the test that the teacher is encouraged to, te to teach to, we see big effects on it, but then they disappear immediately or very quickly, that really suggests that a lot of what we're picking up is, is how good the teacher is at teaching to the test rather than how good the teacher is at teaching. Uh, and so this really gets at a question that we, that we tended to think that we didn't need to to answer, and we could just be technocrats and, and implement these models and not, not have to come up with substantive answers. But, we, but it, it turns out that these models encode an answer to each of these questions, what, which is what is it that we want teachers to do? Do we want teachers to be teaching math and reading and nothing else, or do we want them to be teaching social studies and science and citizenship and all the other, other subjects in the curriculum? Do we want them to teach topics and skills that aren't covered by the state test, or do we just want to, them to teach the names of the programs that each president implemented? Um, and do we want to be, do we care about encouraging long run learning or just doing well on the end of your test? Value added models are only going to encourage math and reading, the topics and skills covered by the test, and the short run. If that's what we care about, then, then these models may be what we want. But if we think that teachers want, we want teachers to be doing other things, value added estimates are going are to penalize that. A second issue, unrelated to the issue of, of what it is that these models are, test, are, are, are picking up. It has to do with bias due to the fact that not all teachers teach random samples of students. We know this isn't true. Um, we know that in, if, if anybody has a kid in school, there's lots of involvement of parents and teachers and principals in, in designing classes. And you might think that that has some effect on the average test scores at the end of the year in the class, even controlling for the beginning of the year tests. And it turns out that that's true. It turns out that it's very rare to see schools where there is random assignment or random assignment conditional on a, on a few prior variables. Value added models are, design, are supposed to be robust to, to small deviations from random assignment, but it turns out that the, the real world deviations are much bigger than that. That, it, that the, the assumptions you need for the value added models to, to uncover causal effects just don't seem to hold in the real world. And so what that means is that the, a score, the value added score that a teacher gets is going to be importantly sensitive to which student a teacher teaches. And since this is research I did and since it was supported by Institute for Education Sciences, and I see my grant officer in the room. I, I should mention that this is IES-supported research. <laughs> but um, but the, what I did to try to evaluate this was look for effects that we knew shouldn't be there. So, the, so we know that a fifth grade teacher can't possibly affect their kids' third grade test scores. The kid, they haven't met the kids yet. But it turns out you can tweak value-added models and estimate effects of fifth grade teachers on third grade test scores. Since we know the true effect is zero, if these models are picking up true effects, they should indicate that fifth grade teachers have, in fact, zero effects on third grade test scores. But what the models indicate is that fifth grade teachers have large effects on third grade test scores. <laughs> um, and that's true under every, all of the different varieties of value-added models that are out there. What, that, what that's telling us is that there are important differences in the third grade test scores of, kid, of, te of kids assigned to different teachers that aren't captured by the value-added models. And, and that's going to create biases against, for or against teachers who teach students of different types. 
Um, and so, so for example, if research studies tend to leave out all sorts of exceptional teachers, teachers who teach ELL classes, teachers who teach special ed classes, we tend to leave them out because they're too complicated. But it's clear that, that if you actually do this in practice, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be very important whether you teach a special ed class or an ELL class or a, or a mainstream class to, in terms of determining what your estimated value added is. Even among the set of regular classes, it's going to matter a lot whether you got, get kids who did, really, did unusually well last year and are likely to revert back to their long run mean this year and do less well and, I'll, and you'll look bad, or teachers who did unusually badly last year and you'll look great when they, when they go back to, to what you would expect from them. And so, so these are, these are all going to be issues with these models. As a sense of, get, of the magnitude of this issue, you can look at the LA Times data that was, that was used, that the LA Times recently released when they came up with estimates of each teacher in Los Angeles's value added. Th those data were, were reanalyzed by Briggs and Domingue, and what they found is that the effects of the teachers that students hadn't yet had, at least in reading, were as large as the effects of the teachers that te the students had already had. Now, the teachers they hadn't yet had couldn't ha possibly have had real effects. So if you're finding large effects of that, that should make you awfully cautious about interpreting the, the estimated effects of the teachers they have had. A lot of what you're likely to be picking up is, is, um, is the student assignments rather than the teacher effectiveness. And this result, this result is very robust. My study was based on data from North Carolina. Uh, you get similar results in Texas, in Florida, in San Diego, in New York City. Essentially everywhere where we have enough data to estimate these models, you can find that, that non-random assignments matter an enormous amount for, for these models. So what is this, why does this matter? It matters because they tell us what's likely to happen if we start to, to take these models seriously in evaluating teachers, if we start to build stakes onto these models. There's something in education that's, that's actually true across the social sciences known as Campbell's Law, which states that the more any quantitative social indicator is used for social decision making, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures and the more apt it will be to distort and corrupt the social processes it's intended to monitor. That is, it's always easier, if we have a flawed measure, it's always easier for a teacher to target the flaws in the measure rather than the reality. Now, there's no reason for a teacher to do that as long as we're not putting stakes on, this, on, this, on these estimates. But if we start telling a teacher your job's on the line unless you get a high enough value added measure, the, way, the, the obvious way to do that is to target the flaws in the model, to start teaching to the test, to start trying to manage which students you teach, and to start focusing on, on short-term drilling rather than long-term learning. And so you can expect all of those things to get worse if we, if, we, um, if we put high stakes on these estimates. You can expect the teachers to lobby the principals for the right students and to refuse to teach the wrong ones. It's going to be a lot harder to recruit a teacher for that ELL class if, if, we're, if, we know, if they know that they're likely to get fired for teaching it. Um, we, the teachers will shift their focus to the content and the material of the chosen test, ignore other subjects and ignore, ignore topics that aren't covered very well by the test. Ignore, they're not going to spend as much time on writing because the test, it's, it's too expensive to test writing and so they'll spend their time drilling analogies instead. Uh, you can expect that they'll sh shift towards drills aimed at short-term performance and ignore the sorts of things that promote long-term reading, long-term learning. You can expect uh, teacher cooperation and collegial support is likely to erode as the teachers realize they're in competition with each other. And uh, as we've seen in recent years, you can expect that outright cheating will rise that in most states, the way we administer tests is the teacher is given the, the packet of tests for all of their students and asked to administer them. There's no way you can do that if you're going to put stakes on it. And even, even if you figure out ways to proctor exams, there will be ways to manipulate the, the results and, and cheat. And we saw that in Atlanta recently. We'll see that elsewhere. Um, there's, and then there's all sorts of more obscure forms of cheating. There was a study that found that the week before state assessments, students were more likely to be suspended if they scored poorly the previous year that there are all sorts of ways that you can manipulate your scores that are not, in fact, truly effective, true effectiveness. And so what that means is that the result of putting high stakes on value-added measures is likely to be not what we intended. Lots of good teachers will be fired, lots of bad teachers will get bonuses, and teachers will focus on raising their measured value-added whether or not that, that corresponds to effective teaching. So you can be pretty sure that measured scores will go up, but it's not at all clear that learning will go up. It could easily go down. And this is something we've learned over and over again in other professions. If you have a measure that has these sorts of imperfections, you can't put too high stakes on it because you'll completely destroy any, the value that the measure has and, and, and create all sorts of distortions that, that you don't want. So I've got a page of references in the slides if you're interested in evidence on these, in, uh, in digging up the details, but thank you.
Today I'm going to actually talk about what it looks like when you attach high stakes consequences to these um, tests when in under value added models. And what I'm doing is research on the SAS, Education Value Added Assessment System, EVAS as it's known, its intended and unintended effects in a major urban school system that is actually using value added to give merit pay and to terminate teachers. Houston Independent School District is the largest highest need district in Texas, the seventh largest school district in the country, and approximately 92% of its students are from racial minority backgrounds. As part of its Aspire program, the district is using EVAS to reward teachers with merit pay and also to terminate them from teaching. It's using value added more than ever, any other district in the entire country for high stakes purposes. What is the SAS EVAS? According to the EVAS on the website, is the most comprehensive reporting package of value added metrics available in the educational market. It's the largest VA system, value added system. Tennessee, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and, and Ohio use it statewide, and other districts and other schools are rapidly adopting and implementing this model. EVAS developers have over 20 years of experience developing this model, so this is arguably the best model that we have in terms of value added. So it's very important to look at its implications once it hits practice. According to EVAS developers, EVAS assesses and predicts student performance with precision and reliability, which goes back to what Professor Hartel was talking about, this consistency. It is the most robust and reliable system available, and teachers who move from one environment to another will rank just as well and should be classified similarly by EVAS over time. So let's put these assumptions to the test and look at three cases in point. In the spring of 2011, a number of the district's teachers' contracts were not renewed largely due to either a significant lack of student progress attributed to attributed to, to the educator and insufficient student ac academic growth reflected by EVAS value added scores. These teachers filed wrongful termination appeals and I served as the expert witness on many of their cases. So let's take a look at their, their EVAS data and see if um, they in fact showed insufficient student academic growth. Here's teacher A. Teacher A had been a teacher for more than 10 years teaching elementary school in the district since 2000. You'll see teacher A's data here since 2007 through 2010, the most recent year for which we had data. And the green is where she added value and the red is where she detracted value. As you'll see, eight out of 16 of these observations are adding value and eight out of 16 are detracting. So with this model, the probability that this teacher was actually an effective teacher was no different than the flip of a coin. Teacher A exceeded expectations across every domain in her supervisor evaluations, and she was given a Teacher of the Month Award in 2010 by her colleagues and a Teacher of the Year Award in 2008. The outcome for Teacher A is she decided not to pursue a due process hearing and decided to quit teaching in the district. Teacher B. Teacher B, a career changer, changer with a bachelor's and a master's degree in mathematics, was certified as a math teacher via the district's alternative teaching certificate program, and she taught middle and high school math. As you'll see, Teacher B's relative value-added scores were negative for two years and then positive for the last year that she had value-added data. Note, though, that she taught alongside another math teacher who taught nearly half of her students' math an equal amount of time per week, yet she was held accountable for the test scores when theoretically she was teaching the students approximately 50% of math the whole year long. Outcome for teacher B, she decided to quit teaching and not pursue a wrongful termination hearing. Teacher C, Graduated with a bachelor's degree in 2005, was also certified via an alternative teaching certificate program, and she took a full-time position in the district in 2006. You'll see here up until 2009, 2010, she added value three out of six times. She detracted value three out of six times. Again, just like teacher A, the probability that she was an effective teacher is no different than a flip of a coin. Now, in 2009, 2010, 
teacher was assigned, teacher C was assigned to teach a large number of English language learners who were transitioned into her classroom. Teacher C said, I went to a transition classroom and now there's a red flag next to my name. I guess now I'm an ineffective teacher? I keep getting letters from the district saying, you've been recognized as an outstanding teacher, this, this, and that. But now because I teach English language learners who transition into my class, my scores drop and I get a flag next to my name for not teaching them well. Teachers in Houston that we talk to generally note that teachers who teach ELLs in transition are the least likely to show growth. And so that gets back to the bias that Professor Rostein specifically was talking about. Outcome for Teacher C, she decided not to pursue a wrongful termination hearing and decided to quit teaching in the district. Some other unintended consequences of the EVAS. Teachers in Houston say that earning merit pay based on EVAS scores is like winning the lottery. Since it appears unpredictable and a function of random year-to-year -year instability is not related to changes in teaching and instruction, one teacher characterized the system as chaotic. Ratings change considerably when teachers change grade levels, as we saw, often from ineffective to effective within one year and vice versa. One teacher noted, I do what I do every year. I teach the way I teach every year. My first year got me pats on the back. My second year got me kicked in the backside. And for my third year, scores were off the charts. I got a huge bonus, and now I'm in the top quartile of all the English teachers. What did I do differently? I have no clue. <laughs> Another teacher noted, we had an eighth grade teacher, a very good teacher, the real science guy. But every year he showed low EVAS growth. My principal flipped him with the sixth grade science teacher who was getting the highest EVAS scores on campus. Huge EVAS scores. And now the sixth grade teacher who moved up is showing no growth, but the eighth grade teacher who was sent down is now getting the biggest bonuses on campus. The conclusion here is that teachers teaching in grades in which English language learners are transitioned into mainstreamed classrooms are the least likely to show added value. One teacher noted, I'm scared to teach in the fourth grade. I'm scared I might lose my job if I teach in an ELL transition grade level because I'm scared my scores are going to drop. And I'm going to get fired because there's probably going to be no growth. Another teacher noted, when they say nobody wants to do fourth grade, nobody wants to do fourth grade. Nobody. Teachers teaching larger numbers of special education students in mainstream classrooms are also found to have lower value-added scores on average. Teachers teaching students in consecutive years report receiving bonuses for the first year and nothing the next as they max out on growth. And this is teachers who loop. So they might teach third grade and they follow teachers into the fourth grade and they're finding that they max out in the third grade and they can't grow their students anymore in the fourth grade. One teacher noted, I found out doing this that I have been competing with myself. Teachers teaching gifted students report adding little value as well because their students are near the top. A gifted teacher noted, every year I have the highest test scores. I have fellow teachers that come up to me when they get their bonuses. One recently came up to me and literally cried. I'm so sorry. I'm like, don't be sorry. It's not your fault. Here I am with the highest test scores and I'm getting zero in bonuses. It makes no sense year to year how this works. How do I, how do I, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get higher than 100%. Another gifted teacher noted, I have students in a fifth grade reading class who score at the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade levels in reading, but I'm like, please babies, score at the ninth grade level, because if you don't score at the ninth or tenth grade or higher in fifth grade with me, I'm going to show negative growth. Even though you, you're gifted and you're talented and you're high, I can only push you so much higher when you're already so high. I'm scared. Other unintended effect, or other intended effects. According to EVAS developers, the EVAS provides valuable diagnostic information about instructional practices. It helps educators become more proactive, make more sound instructional choices, helps teachers use resources more, more strategically to ensure that every student has the chance to succeed. Again, let's take a look at the data in terms of response. EVAS output does not make sense to educators. According to the teachers, we cannot figure this thing out. It is very ambiguous. We are all teachers confused. 
because EVAS data are received months after students leave and because it offers no insights about practice, teachers note they are learning nothing about what they did or did not do effectively or how they might improve their instruction based on these data. Teachers are frustrated by the lack of professional development provided about their value-added scores or how to understand them, especially with the instabilities that they're seeing and how to use them to improve their own instruction. Evaluation of classroom practice is also being distorted. Teachers note that supervisors are beginning to skew their observational scores to match value-added output rather than offering an independent assessment of learning. So they're using the EVAS as the, the indicator that is trumping the supervisor evaluation scores. And so principals who see that a teacher might be low on the EVAS will skew their scores down to make sure that they're consistent. Teachers report learning how to boost their scores by avoiding certain students and types of students and by seeking stu assignments to teach particular subjects and grades. Teachers all agreed it's better to get average kids. Yes, because the regular kids, you can grow those kids. The ones on the extremes, the outliers, it's most difficult to grow. Lastly, teachers are held accountable for subject areas that other teachers are teaching to the same students at the same time. Teachers are being evaluated for content that they are not teaching, but for which they're teachers of record. Teachers are being excused from value added if class sizes are too small that specifically affects special education students. And finally, conclusions. Teachers are inaccurately evaluated by value added, me value -added measures like EVAS. According to one teacher, this system, which is supposed to be the best system out there with 20 years of development, has so many imperfections, it's not even funny. The unintended effects include large variations in scores, unconnected to changes in practice, there's unreliability, instability, the confusion and demoralization of teachers, distortion of other evaluation information, disincentives to teach newly mainstreamed English language learners, special education students, gifted students, and those students in certain grade levels and also disincentives to remain in teaching. Thank you. You've been uh, sitting for a long time, and uh, thank you for your attention to all of the research findings. This is the interactive part of the program. So I'm going to ask you to evaluate a teacher in a minute. So have your pencils ready. Um, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is the set of strategies for measuring and developing teacher effectiveness that uh, go beyond the use of uh, test scores, which we've heard a lot about in the last couple of presentations. Uh, we started this, and Jack uh, Jennings launched the program with the reality that teacher evaluation has long been a problem. Uh, in a report issued last year by the Accomplished California Teacher Group, uh, Jane Fung, who was a National Board Certified Teacher and a Milken Award winner, uh, described her experience as follows. I've had ad administrators who never came into my classroom for formal observations or asked me for anything more than an initial planning or goal sheet. I've had administrators observe a formal lesson and put the feedback sheet in my box without ever having spoken to me about a lesson. And I've had years where I'm just asked to sign the end of the year evaluation sheet without being observed. Uh, so those kinds of stories come from teachers frequently. We know that you know, changes need to be made. There are some places that have been doing more productive teacher evaluation over the years, but this has been a long-standing problem. Um, I was involved in a study with uh, my colleague Art Wise at the RAND Corporation 20 some years ago uh, looking at for teacher evaluation systems that were effective. And we scoured the whole country before we found four programs that we could study uh, that actually were able to make personnel decisions and help teachers improve. And that has changed some, uh, but there's still uh, quite a lot of work to be done out there. If we think about what our goals would be for effective teacher evaluation systems, we would want to measure good teaching accurately. And we've seen that um, the value-added measures that are currently uh, being uh, tried um, have some real problems with accuracy. Uh, we would want to create an integrated understanding of what teachers do and what their students learn that takes context into account so that we could use some evidence 
of student learning in a way that is connected to what teachers are actually doing in their practice and the context within which they're doing it. And that ought to be possible to do, to build integrated systems. We would want to enable school leaders, mentors and coaches, and teachers themselves to become skilled in examining and supporting teaching. So there's a learning process that actually happens as a result of the evaluation. We would want to provide information for improvement of practice through feedback and professional development uh, so that at the end of the day uh, we know that teaching is improving and we would want to enable timely personnel decisions that can happen without years and years of uh, litigation and other things that do prevent uh, the termination of teachers who should be uh, out of the classroom if they cannot improve. So how do we evaluate teaching? This is your opportunity. Uh, and many of you know this teacher. This is um, Ferris Bueller's high school history teacher. Um, and I want you to think about uh, how you would evaluate this teacher and what you would look for. Okay, here we go. And so did the kids. <laughs> so I know this isn't quite fair, but uh, very quickly, um, I'd like to know, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, how many of you gave uh, Ferris Bueller's high school history teacher a rating, 1 being the worst and 10 being the highest, a rating of uh, 5 or above? OK, anyone? Anyone? Uh, a rating of 4 or below? A rating of two or below? OK. <laughs> All right, what are the factors you're looking for? Very quickly, you don't have a lot of time. What would you want to look for in evaluating a teacher? Yes. Interaction with students, some, th some kind of engagement. Yes. OK, what else? OK, present ability to present the information in a productive way, yes? Evidence of student learning, OK. Yes. Enthusiasm, OK. Yeah? Be able to relate to the students. Yeah? Calling students by name, some indication that he even knows who's in the room. That would might be good. OK. So we could, we could go on and on. And in fact, we do have a lot of evidence about uh, what uh, effective teachers do, and if I had time, I would show you, uh, you know, an effective teacher. Uh, this is a, a terrific teacher uh, who teaches in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, she's a national board certified teacher who exemplifies all the features that you might want to, to look at. But we have research that's gone on for many, many years uh, about what kinds of teaching practices, in fact, using very uh, a wide array of measures of learning, contribute to gains in student learning. And we find uh, pretty consistently that teachers who promote gains in student learning um, understand their subject matter deeply and they can use it flexibly. They can connect what the students know to what uh, the, they know. They engage students in active learning. That's the first thing that you all mentioned. They create intellectually ambitious tasks that actually represent the way that you would use the knowledge outside the classroom. They use well-chosen teaching strategies and they know when to use which strategies for which purposes. They assess students' learning continuously continuously and they adapt teaching to student needs. We have a lot of new evidence on the use of formative assessment and the large gains in student learning that can come about when teachers know and use those assessment techniques. They create effective scaffolds and supports to help students get from where they are in their understanding to where they need to be. And we know a lot about what those look like and what teachers do when they're implementing them. They provide clear standards, constant feedback. Feedback turns out to be enormously important in the learning process and opportunities for students to revise their work in response to that feedback. And they effectively manage a collaborative classroom 
in which all students really have a sense that they belong, that they have men uh, membership, and they use that for learning. And so there's literally, you know, mountains and mountains of studies that, that deal with these traits of effective teaching. And these qualities have been embedded in standards for teaching. The first standards uh, that really worked to bring the research base uh, forward were the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards that were developed um, beginning after 1987. And the board, as many of you know, has a portfolio based on those standards that's used to certify accomplished teaching. Uh, another group, the Interstate New Teacher Assessment and Support Consortium, a group of states, uh, translated those standards into standards for beginning teachers, which are used uh, in more than 40 states. They are the basis of new licensing assessments, and they're recently revised to reflect the Common Core standards. And then there are uh, many teacher evaluation instruments used in districts that are standards-based, that take these standards and try to uh, put them into a tool that allows you to look at teaching intelligently uh, against some things that really matter. Not like the old days when I was teaching, when you had things like, were your bulletin boards neat? You know, did you write the objective on the board? Things that might make the classroom look tidy, but may not actually uh, result in greater learning. Uh, we, uh, in these standards-based evaluations, typically you see structured observations of teaching that are based on those standards, along with other evidence of practice, lesson plans, student work, and other things that let you know what the teacher's doing. Uh, we find that they do offer stable evidence over time, unlike the value-added metrics that bounce around from year to year. You typically get a much more stable representation of the teacher's uh, effectiveness. They are related, as we found in some other studies, to student learning gains. And this is an approach to uh, the use of value-added models in larger-scale studies that has uh, allowed us to validate some measures. And they help teachers become more effective when they're used as a source of continuous feedback. Some studies of districts that use metrics like this in evaluation find that not only do they reflect teachers' value-added um, contributions, but they also increase teachers' effectiveness. We have examples across the country of evaluation systems in places like Cincinnati, Denver, Rochester. New Mexico has a tiered system. Vaughan Charter School and other charter schools, as well as places like Singapore, the Netherlands, and elsewhere that use these kinds of standards-based evaluation tools. Some of you know the Teacher Advancement Program, which is used in a number of states and districts, which borrowed from those standards and put it into a tool. Uh, and furthermore, trains evaluators for four days before they're in the classroom, uh, has continuous feedback for uh, teachers and so on. Uh, and a number of these uh, systems uh, have incorporated evidence of student learning drawn from classroom work as well as classroom school and district assessments, but they've done so in an integrated fashion. They've said, what are you doing? Who are you teaching? What is a range of evidence about the outcomes? And how can we combine those? As we would do in uh, medicine in evaluating a physician's practice, uh, we would look at outcomes, we would look at who the patients were, we'd look at the um, meeting professional standards of practice together as a way of evaluating. Uh, successful systems develop evaluation expertise. It, we found um, through a, a range of studies that it's not enough simply to have an instrument. You need to train evaluators so they know what they're looking for. Uh, you need to release and fund expert mentors to offer assistance and districts that do that so that beginners and teachers who need additional help can get it are able to make better personnel decisions. Uh, in some uh, districts that have created peer assistance and review systems, uh, they've created evaluation panels and processes uh, in which these uh, panels make decisions about tenure and continuation. They're able uh, both to make good decisions and to dismiss teachers who do not improve without lawsuits, without uh, dragging out the time uh, to, to make the decision that is needed uh, uh, to move teachers uh, out as well. Other measures of effective teaching are being developed and tested. Uh, the Gates Foundation has this Measures of Effective Teaching Project, which is really um, based on the idea that we can validate measures of teacher evaluation against measures of student learning growth for larger samples, and this is where it differs from applying it to individual teacher evaluation, for larger samples of teachers and students, and look at whether, in fact, uh, certain uh, indicators of teaching 
uh, predict teachers' uh, value-added uh, gains on a large scale. They've done a video analyses of teaching uh, that are similar to the standards-based approaches I described earlier, student evaluations of teachers, which have turned out to be uh, fairly predictive and uh, reliable. We actually have some evidence about student evaluations going back 30 or 40 years that they can be, when they're um, well-designed, reliable uh, data about teachers. Uh, assessments of pedagogical content knowledge. There's also a teacher performance assessment consortium that has uh, developed, uh, is using performance assessments developed in uh, states like California and piloting that for beginning teachers in 20 states. So we have a variety of tools um, and some states are looking to use those kinds of tools in a tiered way so that they're able to assess very systematically teachers when they enter the field, uh, when they move to a professional license or gain tenure, and when they move to an advanced license or certification or become a master teacher or a lead teacher. Now these assessments are of interest because uh, we believe that teaching can be improved if we create means for examining teaching that are related to effectiveness, and if we can develop systems that are reliable, consistent, and powerful in shaping preparation, professional development, and practice. We don't want teachers looking at the results of evaluation saying, I, this makes no sense to me. I don't know how it has a link to what I'm doing. We want systems where teachers can say, if I do X and develop my practice in the following ways, I'll improve and my students will learn more. And we want to have robust measures for high stakes decisions. We need to be able to make better decisions at licensure, at tenure, uh, when we're deciding about continuation and when we're deciding about advancement. Uh, I mentioned that some of these tools have been examined for what we call predictive validity. Uh, do they predict what teachers' uh, contributions to student learning will be? Uh, National Board Certification has a large body of studies. Many studies have found uh, that board certification predicts teacher effectiveness. The National Research Council concluded that teachers with this credential are more effective than other teachers at raising their students' test scores. The Connecticut Best Portfolio was another version of a performance-based approach uh, for beginning teachers. Uh, it was found to strongly predict student learning gains, uh, to significantly uh, 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 predict which teachers would raise English language arts scores. And interestingly, the Praxis 1 and 2 tests, the college that the teacher attended their GPA in college, had no effect on predicting teachers' effectiveness. The California PACT assessment, another performance assessment for beginning teachers, has shown a significant relationship between scores and student learning gains. And a teacher who scores at the top of that measure uh, has a 20 percentile point difference in student achievement as compared to one who scores at the bottom. But again, when we have these larger samples, uh, we are able to draw more stable conclusions. What do these performance assessments do? They use teaching plans, videotapes, teachers' assignments, scored student work, commentaries to understand what teachers are doing and why. They look at teachers' plans for the group as a whole and for individual students, how do they work with English learners? How do they work with special education students? They look at teaching and learning as they unfold. Uh, they focus on student learning in many ways, often including student learning evidence in the body of evidence in the portfolio, and they score it reliably and consistently. Uh, one of the other potential benefits of beginning to use these kinds of systematic approaches to teacher evaluation is that they actually improve candidate learning. Many of you, how many of you have been involved with National Board Certification in one way or another over many years? So a number of folks in the audience have probably heard teachers say it was the best professional development that I ever engaged in. I learned so much. I'm a different teacher now than I was before. We're also finding that kind of effect for teachers, beginning teachers, who are uh, exposed to these kinds of standards-based performance assessments of teaching. Uh, one beginning teacher uh, put it this way after they completed uh, a performance assessment. I think for me the most valuable thing was the sequencing of the lessons, teaching the lesson, evaluating what the kids were getting, what they weren't getting, having that be re reflected in my next lesson, the teach, assess, teach, assess, teach, assess process. 
Uh, you're constantly changing based on what the children learned. That's what we want teachers to be able to do as professionals that many teachers never learned to do. Uh, but, but we now know can be learned uh, even by beginning teachers when they're put in a situation where they're asked to demonstrate that skill. Uh, these kinds of assessments also can provide feedback to teacher uh, educators, to teacher evaluators, uh, to uh, cooperating teachers and others uh, who will say things like, in any of these uh, instances, the scoring experiences force me to revisit what matters in assessing teachers, what matters in preparing teachers. Uh, as a cooperating teacher said, it forces you to be clear about good teaching, what it looks like, what it sounds like, to look at your own practice critically with new eyes. Again, a learning process that extends both to the person being evaluated and to the people doing the evaluating. So that at the end of the day, there's a common shared vision of what good teaching can be uh, that motivates the process of evaluation. So in, in closing, uh, teacher evaluation systems that support student and teacher learning uh, should include evidence that illuminates standards-based practices that are related to effectiveness. We should continue to try to validate uh, what we use as measures in terms of how they are related to teacher effectiveness. They ought to have an integrated set of measures that show both what teachers do and what happens in student learning as a result. Uh, and, try to, and try to develop ways to integrate that information in a productive way. And they should have systems that support evaluation expertise uh, and well-grounded decisions uh, for both teachers and for the system as a whole. Thank you. Well, we've had an extraordinary experience of four university professors making all their presentations within one hour. And so I'd like to thank the panel very much. You've given us a lot to think about. Now we go to Bethany Little. Bethany carries on her shoulders the burden of having to speak from the policy world. But let me just frame up a question for Bethany. Uh, and I, I realize you're speaking alone. You don't have a comrade with you, so you have to give us all of the thoughts of the, from the policy world. But it seems like if this is where the re, what the research shows, it shows all sorts of problems with value added. It shows that there should be a much more sophisticated way of evaluating teachers than we have today. And yet uh, the pressures in the policy world are towards uh, use of test scores, toward a use of value added, not only in teacher evaluation, but uh, value added is considered a major reform of the NCLB accountability system, using value added instead of the system we have today. But if the, the research is correct, there's all sorts of problems with this approach. So how should the policymakers deal with this? Will this research have an effect on policy? If it does, what kind of effect will it have? Uh, what's the direction of using uh, test scores uh, more and more to, uh, for accountability, but also for evaluation? So we'll turn now to Bethany to answer all these questions. <laughs> I don't even remember all those questions, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> much less answer them all. Um, good morning, and uh, thank you for having me here. Just a quick comment in case there are any reporters or bloggers in the room, can you please consider my comments today to be on background? Um, and if anybody wants specific quotes, happy to work out that later. Um, it's really an honor to be sitting up here with these folks. I have um, read many of these papers. I've been learning about these issues from Linda for years. Um, and it's, uh, it's a lot of really helpful and interesting information that has actually already had a significant impact, I would say, on the policy conversation that we've been having. I am sorry that my colleague Lindsay isn't here in part because we've been working so closely together on these policies. I think you would hear a lot of agreement between us on the way we're looking at some of this, which is a rare pleasure in Washington these days. So um, too bad we can't treat you to that. Um, before I get into kind of the specifics about where we might want to go with policy, I want to just bear with me. I'm the mom of a six-year-old and a three-year-old, and I adore my children, so can't resist an anecdote, and this is a true one. I came home on uh, Monday night, and my three-year-old ran up, and big hug, and he suddenly, you know, kind of slumped in my arms, and I thought, my God, he feels a little hot to me. And so um, I, he was really kind of lethargic, and he wanted to snuggle a lot, and I realized 
Um, I think he has a fever, so I, we have one of those thermometers that you stick in the kid's ear, so I stuck it in his ear and it came out as 101.7, and I always do it twice, so I stuck it in this ear and it came out as 101.2. Over the next 24 hours, and frankly, many, many more times since then, I've been sticking my thermometer in his ear, and I'm not sure it's ever come out with the same number twice, but it's always shown that he has a fever, and in fact, he has croup, so he definitely has a fever. Um, and when we think about value added, I think um, from a policy perspective, we're thinking about it a little bit as that thermometer. It's not perfect. It does vary. And on its own, I'm not sure it would be all that useful to me. But when added to the fact that I could feel that he was hot, that he was lethargic, that he has a bad cough, it gave me some important information. And I wouldn't be much of a mom if I hadn't given him some ibuprofen to see if I couldn't help bring that fever down. And I think from our perspective, we want to think of value added as a part of that suite of things that could be a policy and practice tool. And I emphasize the practice part because from a, from a policy perspective, when we're looking at the questions of um, value added and teacher evaluation, um, which are not the same thing, and I want to emphasize we do not think they're the same thing, um, we want to think about how do we use those first and foremost as opportunities to improve teaching and practice. Um, I think very often uh, we quickly seem to um, descend into conversations about who can be fired and who can be given bonuses. And um, I think that's not where we, in a policy level, and I can say in a bipartisan Senate approach to these policies, that is not where we've started the conversation. We have, in fact, started the conversation in what is it that we know that matters, what is it we know that needs improvement, and how is it we can help support that in states and districts across the country. I'll tell you some of the conclusions we've come to. Um, we know that. Um, the, that teacher quality matters. We know that it matters enormously. Does it overcome everything? We know that it doesn't. But we do know that it can make a huge difference for students um, based on all of the evidence that some of these folks have been bringing us for a long time. We also know that current teacher evaluation systems in many cases, and I would very sure to say in the majority of cases, are failing both teachers and students. Um, they are not giving us information about teachers that is useful to either policymakers, principals, leaders who are trying to improve student achievement, nor to the teachers themselves who are trying to improve their own craft. I was listening to your presentation about the frustrations folks had with EVAS. I have heard that over and over again from every teacher I have ever spoken to about their teacher evaluation system, except for teachers who are in TAP, I should say. Um, they, you hear it everywhere. It's not about EVAS. In general, teacher evaluation systems are not helping teachers get the information they want. They are not connected deeply to understandings of um, professional development, to collaboration, to opportunities for improvement in ways that they should be designed to be used. And so um, while I don't doubt that that's a flaw of EVAS, I would also venture to say it's a flaw of most teacher evaluation. Um, we know that student achievement does matter. That at the heart of the conversation, if we're not asking whether or not the students are learning, we are actually failing to ask the right question. And I appreciate a lot of what Linda laid out um, and I think we need to use that. I think that needs to be a significant part of the policy conversation. But one thing I've learned over years of policy making here is that mandating process is often not a great way to go, especially from the federal level, which I recognize is not what you were suggesting. What you're suggesting is different. But it is important to understand you could give me all the mechanics of how to surf in like 10 easy steps, but if I have terrible balance and don't know how to swim, I'm not going to be a good surfer and it doesn't matter if I follow your 10 easy steps. At the end of the day, we have to ask the question, are the students learning what they need to know? I used to get really frustrated with people who'd come talk to me and they would spend their whole time on an anecdote and now that I have kids, I'm going to do that again, so bear with me. Um, so my kid had um, the teacher last year, again, this is a true story, my kid had a teacher last year who was not the most popular kindergarten teacher. It was not the teacher parents asked for. And in the process of that, my son got um, late onset strabismus, which is commonly called lazy eye, in October of his um, kindergarten year and had surgery for it to correct it in February. He spent a significant part of his kindergarten year with double vision. You want to talk about a challenge for a teacher. There's nothing she could do. There's nothing I could do as a parent about this challenge that had been presented um, to her. 
And um, the teacher across the hall, and this is literally true, is the most popular kindergarten teacher. All of the parents want that kindergarten teacher. She babysits on weekends. She comes to the kids' soccer games. Everyone loves her. I talked to a parent who's had three kids go through kindergarten, and she said, you know, nobody else will say this, but I love the teacher your son has. All of her kids start first grade reading. Now, that's not true of a lot of the kindergarten teachers here. Um, and in fact, we have one kindergarten teacher who it's, it's patently not his philosophy. None of his kids, no, except for the ones whose parents are kind of pushing them, most of his kids don't start first grade reading, but they're super prepared and within the first month or two they read. They're probably equally good kindergarten teachers. I'm not judging those two teachers. I'm saying there are different approaches that can work differently. But the teacher across the hallway, rumor has it in the um, conversations at school did not get a high score on impact here in the DC system, which caused such a furor it contributed to the leaving of the principal in our school. There is such um, concern and outrage over that question, but I don't know if she's a good teacher. She's popular. She babysits on weekends. She goes to soccer games. At the end of the day, that's not actually the question I'm most interested in asking as a policymaker. What I'm interested in asking is, does she need some professional development on how to help her kids learn to read? That's my first question. Are there other people she could collaborate with who could help her be a better math teacher? Those are the things that we are after in this conversation. So in this area of policy, um, we are, uh, I, I try to remember that we should act with bold humility. We need to remember that um, federal policy will drive a lot. And we need to be bold. We need to take the next steps that will advance the country in as much as we can. But we also need to be extremely humble in recognizing the limitations of the art and science of value added, of assessment. I want to talk about quality of assessment, too, because somebody touched on that, and it's hugely important. Um, and of evaluation in general. And we need to remember the limitations of our own ability to impact people's policy and practice on the ground. Us mandating things is not always the best way to drive the best outcome. And we need to be cognizant of that when we make policy. Um, but that said, there is a lot we can do to try to be um, more supportive. And I do think um, we can get into the details, and we want to spend some time talking. But um, but we we shouldn't. We do need to understand the test quality is going to matter enormously. Um, that random assignment is a funny conversation to have around here. There isn't random assignment. I recognize that. On the other hand, there shouldn't be. My the teacher my sixth grader has my six year old has this year is known for really being good with squirmy boys. A lot of teachers see that as the kids they don't want in their classroom. She's really good with them. And so when you look at um, you made a comment about teachers who go across environments and well, they should be equally good across environments. I'm not sure that's true. From a policy perspective, there are teachers who actually shouldn't teach in low-income, high-challenge schools. They should teach in schools where teaching is maybe different and can, can be done um, within their skill set more easily. I don't think we should think teachers are all the same. It's the whole widget effect conversation that um, has driven a lot of this. And so um, anyway, that's a lot of response to your question, Jack, and I'm sure there's more to come. Uh, we have a lot of people here, and uh, I know there's going to be a, a great uh, deal of interest in questioning. Uh, we also have Assistant Secretary Posny here. Do you want to begin questions? No? We have the head. Uh, OK. Uh, let's uh, go at it. What are the questions? Bethany, do you want? Um, so uh, I'm not supposed to talk about money. I have an appropriations colleague who talks about money. Um, but I will say uh, we spend billions of dollars on Title II right now. And I'm not sure we get a whole lot from that money. Um, one of the sad things is we don't even know what we get from that money because we don't even ask um, how that money is really used and, and what we get out of it. So I do think there is a lot of money in this system that needs to be spent better, and I do think the teacher evaluation, good systems of it are a good place to spend it. But I also worry, um, somebody talked earlier about, um, this is one of my favorite statements of the morning, sometimes policy strays away from what we actually know. Um, that was an um, understatement of the year. <laughs> um, and I think it's often because people look for a magic bullet and preferably a cheap one. 
And so we need to be really cognizant of the fact that this is value added is not a magic bullet. Teacher evaluation is not a magic bullet, and it's certainly not a cheap one. And to the degree that people try to do this on the cheap, we will be doing a disservice to the policy, to the teachers, to the students. Does anybody on the panel want to respond to what Bethany said or what the questioner said? Okay, go ahead. If you could identify yourself too, that would be helpful. Sure, good morning. My name is Dara Baldwin. I'm a policy analyst at Nickel National Council Independent Living with the longest um, cross-disability advocacy organization. And I want to say hello to the panel. Thank you. Thank you to you researchers for helping us be policymakers. We really need your work. Um, my question is in reference to special ed. Thank you for mentioning it, um, Jesse, in, in your comments about it. Um, and I'm glad to see that that's a part of it, the value added. But what about these services, the people around the um, special ed students, such as transitioning, indicator 14, making sure they go off to college, um, graduate from high school indicator two. Um, so evaluating those people who assist the VR people, the social workers and that kind of that group, where, is, where are they in this conversation? Thank you. Certainly in the research on value added, they're nowhere. And I think a general view is that value added type methods are gonna be completely useless for evaluating teachers who are teaching students who are very, who are much different at all from, from a typical student, any, any sort of, it's not even, many students can't even take the tests and if they could if we can force them to fill out some bubbles the the results don't mean anything and i just don't i think that we have to be serious about the fact that right now about a third of teachers you can calculate value added scores for there's movements to expand testing so that you can do it for more teachers but there are always going to be a lot of a lot of people in the schools and in the education system who we just can't use these methods to evaluate I think that the point that Jesse's making that uh, kind of has multiple implications for this conversation is that uh, to really understand outcomes, we need a range of very nuanced, thoughtful measures that are appropriate for different kinds of students in different kinds of contexts. Uh, right now, we're not having that conversation about how to bring the range of evidence about outcomes in, a, in an integrated way into an analysis of you know what schools are able to do and what individual teachers are able to do because right now we're just using uh, the specific tests that are inappropriate for a lot of students um, and uh, are narrow even for the students who you can get some kind of measure on for them and the 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 bigger um, challenge is how do we both expand the range of measures and use them in ways that do not produce a situation where, for example, teachers who take on kids who are not likely to do as well on those measures in terms of gains um, are not given huge disincentives and schools given huge disincentives to serve the kids. Because we already have that situation. We already have kids being pushed out of schools in the United States at very high rates. We already have teachers, you know, avoiding schools which have high populations of kids with um, you know, certain kinds of challenges. And so, you know, we don't want the teacher who is good with the squirmy boys uh, to no longer be willing to take them because once there's a value added measure, it'll be clear that actually boys don't gain as fast in reading in the first few grades as girls do, particularly if they're squirmy. You know, we need to, we need to be able to look at this in a much more nuanced way. And I think we should look to medicine a little bit more perhaps than we are doing right now. Um, there has been a move in medicine as well to look at patient outcomes in terms of evaluating physicians. And there was a move uh, very similar to the move in, in education to evaluate doctors based on mortality rates. Um, and to rank and sort them in that way. Of course, what that does is, you know, create a disincentive to go into areas like um, AIDS treatment and an incentive to go into well baby care. It also creates a disincentive for cardiac surgeons, for example, to serve very sick patients. So they found out in New York when they ranked teachers on, or, or physicians on mortality rates that everyone's rates got better, but when they did a study, fewer very sick patients were being treated in New York. The ones who had money were being sent to the Cleveland Clinic and to Canada, and the ones who didn't have money were not getting treated because doctors were saying, if you have too many needs, I'm not taking you on for surgery. And that's the, the, the threat that we have for you know, students with special education needs and others that teachers will start to say, 
I'm not taking, the, that teacher who's so good with all those kids who's taken them into her class year after year will say, I can't do that anymore. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, what I meant by two different languages was that I hear the researchers say that there's all sorts of problems with value added. There's problems with including student test scores and teacher evaluations. There's all sorts of problems. But what I heard Bethany say was that I understand all your problems. There's deficiencies. There's uh, reservations we have to have. But our policy mandate, in our imperative, is to find some way to include student achievement in evaluating teachers, and uh, because that's the most important thing. So what would you tell the, the Congress to do if they felt they had to include student achievement in evaluating teachers? How should they do it exactly? Jesse wants to go first, and I'll, I'll add on. What we learned from other fields where people aren't producing widgets, where the production process is complex, where the job has lots of different facets, there, there are commonalities about the way that, that people are evaluated. One is that, that you put a lot of resources into it. There are talks about rules of thumb that you have one full-time manager for every five or six workers. That, we're nowhere near that in, the, in education. And those people, their job is just to do performance assessment and evaluation and feedback. Another rule of thumb is that you use this to provide feedback and often, often you'll see that companies completely separate the compensation and retention decision from the evaluation process because they don't want the evaluations to be corrupted by, by the incentives that are, that are around, around high stakes uses. Another is that any one measure doesn't get too much weight and that, that you allow some subjective judgment to offset the, the and to ignore the flaw, the, me the measure when, it cl when it's clear that it's a flawed measure and not really indicative of true, of true performance. All of those are, it's obvious how you could apply those to education, but none of those are really how we're doing it when we're, when we're pushing ahead with this. Linda? Uh, I would just add a couple points to that. Um, I think we ought to be looking for multiple kinds of evidence of student learning and outcomes that are part of a portfolio of evidence that we look at with respect to teachers. So we would care whether teachers are, for example, helping kids transition you know, into the workplace, whether they're supporting you know, their movement towards graduation. We would care whether uh, they can show learning on a variety of classroom assessments as well as on other external assessments. We would not let any one measure trump the rest of the decision-making process, which is, I think, the concern that's coming from the research community. In New York now, a teacher can't get tenure uh, unless they show that they're in the effective band of the um, uh, value-added scores. That trumps all the rest of the data. Uh, and there, too, as we see in um, the case in Houston, teachers who uh, serve gifted and talented kids don't, aren't showing growth, those who serve new English learners and special education students. So we could just get rid of all the teachers in the workforce who are teaching kids who are not well measured by tests, which, by the way, on No Child Left Behind, have been told to only measure grade level standards. So now we have tests all across the country that are only supposed to measure grade level standards, which means they don't measure much above the grade level. They don't measure much below the grade level. They don't measure growth on either side. So the point is that we need multiple measures uh, of practice, what teachers are doing, that we believe is well-founded, and multiple measures of learning and how that looks and for ver the kids that you have with appropriate measures for those kids that get integrated in, an, in a combined analysis or assessment of what the teacher is doing and what the kids are learning. It doesn't seem to be where the policy world is going. In Florida, uh, isn't half the pay of teachers going to be determined by test scores now, by student achievement? And that's for this upcoming school year. What's going to happen in Florida? How are good, they going to make Good teachers are going to leave teaching in Florida, I think. And, and also, when you're looking at what Linda's talking about, this multiple indicators, the number one standard in our, in our profession is to not use a test score as a sole indicator of anything. That's our number one standard. So if you look at these multiple indicators and you kind of look at maybe just the construct of teaching effectiveness that we're trying to capture, and right now we're over relying on test scores to capture this, but you use multiple indicators, kind of like a pie chart, as different pieces of the pie, and like Jesse was talking about, with this equal weight, so one isn't going to trump the other. But theoretically, if we look at validity, what we call criterion or concurrent levels of validity, 
All of these things, if they are effectively capturing the teacher effectiveness construct, should be correlated. It's kind of like an inter, inter reader reliability, if you've ever heard of that, when you've got multiple people looking at an essay and you want to make sure that you have consistency. This, it, we are calling for like an inter indicator reliability here. So if we have a teacher who's high value added, but the supervisor is like, no way, this teacher is not that great we know that we have a problem with either one or possibly both of those indicators. And so we know that we have to put ourselves in check before we give them the check for merit pay. So it's really this construct and all of these pieces need to correlate. Then we can actually validly say and reliably say this is a good teacher and maybe this isn't such a good teacher. I saw a lot of hands now. Um, hello, I'm Laurie Calvert and I am a teacher in Asheville, North Carolina and I'm here for two years, a temporary gig with Department of Education. I'm going back to teaching. I have just learned that I need to be very careful about which students are in my classes and that's a sad thing. Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask is from a policy standpoint, what can we do to make sure that that non-value-added part is taken so much more seriously. I mean, I, I'm a 14-year veteran and I've never had a serious evaluation. I've never had a principal spend much time in my classroom. I mean, more than 10 minutes and I get all the high marks on the ratings, right? But nobody's ever there. And when I went to my state board and advocated for, um, got a chance to speak to them and advocated for principals being in the classroom so much more, I got a call from my superintendent who said, give me a break. When would we have time for that? Right? So I, I just feel like there needs to be some policy to incent principals knowing how to do evaluation and principals or someone actually um, having the time, having their job description tied into taking that very seriously because what they tend to do is They've built relationships with these teachers and, you know, this teacher's kid may be babysitting their kid and they don't want to put, a, you know, a bad evaluation on anything. And it's, it's really, you know, just all drive-by. Ed, did you want to say something? Uh, thanks, Jack. I was, I was going to comment on the previous point, but what I, uh, part of what I say may be responsive to this as well. Um, the, the problem was how to incorporate the value added or, or some kind of evidence about student achievement in teacher evaluation. And the first thing that I think we need, uh, responding to some of what Linda said, is better evidence of other kinds to supplement. It doesn't do any good to say value added is only going to be 20% or 50% or X percent if the other percentage really isn't there. Because whatever, because the measure that we have is a hard, you know, or at least a perceptible number is, is going to end up carrying a lot more weight and may even end up driving what the other numbers look like. So the first thing is, is to have more of those kinds of systems. The second thing that we need is a uh, policy that's sensitive to the complexity of combining different sources of information. I remember a conversation with a, a newspaper reporter who was pushing me for should it be 20%, should it be 50%. I finally just said, what's the right percentage weight to give to biased information? You don't, you don't think about it that way. You, I would, be, I would be the first person to say that a principal should have access to a teacher's value-added scores, and if a teacher has low scores year after year, that principal absolutely should know about it and should have a chance to look hard at what's going on and see whether some kind of correct, corrective action is needed or not. Possibly the scores could be used as a trigger, but there has to be some more nuanced way of bringing that information into a dialogue with other sources of information that are more robust to come up with a wise uh, policy. Okay. Go ahead. I'm Geraldine Robbins, and I'm the teacher of the squirmy boys. Uh, Thank you. I, too, am squirmy. Uh, I have a question about what appears to be a disconnect between our general assessment and evaluation and the boots-on-the-ground evaluation. What I just heard from the gentleman on the very end is that the principals should have access to these value-added scores so that they have some idea of, of the assessment of their teachers. One might argue if the principal were to walk into the classroom 
without the value-added scores in his or her hands, he, would, he or she would more than likely have an idea of, of the effectiveness or of the quality of that teacher, the quality of the learning that's going on. Uh, I think that that's an elephant in the room that we're not talking about because we have obligations. We as teachers have obligations to assess our students' learning. Our administrators have obligations to assess our performance on the job. If they're not doing the work, it, it seems like it keeps rolling higher and higher. And then I picture this huge umbrella of genericity. And that's not even a word, but I'm mathematics. So I can make up words as I go along. Um, that then we spend lots of time trying to make specific. Uh, I, it's a comment more than a question, but I think we have, we have a hole that needs to be discussed. Any comments? Yes, sir. Uh, is there a mic? Yeah. And writes for the Washington Post every now and then. Once in a while. Uh, but I think if, you, if you're going to get practical, I mean, teachers do want to improve. But you've got people coming into your room with, with the checklist mentality. And what they're trying to do is cover themselves for their superior, who's trying to cover them, or the, or herself or himself for the superintendent. And you get a sense that they're not really trying to help you. It's kind of a cover your ass mentality. Uh, the problem with teaching is, is mediocrity. So you're not going to get rid of a lot of people uh, unless, unless you're willing to go to the mat in enormous lawsuits. But what you've got to do is have people coming into the room that teachers trust and that make teachers feel, oh, well, you've got somebody to tell me I really want to learn. As it is now, the only way teachers are really learning, at least what I've learned, is being with other teachers, being an AP reader with 400 English teachers and talking at night with them. But the, the valuation as it is now, a lot of it is just uh, checklist mentality. And one other thing I wanted to say, I read uh, Steve Brill's book, Class Warfare. And after hearing Linda, I've been a big fan of Linda for years. Uh, it's so discouraging that the Obama people, John Schnur and others, tried to keep Linda out of a lot of the policy making and a lot of the discussions, and they've done so to their detriment. Uh, that's my last comment. <laughs> uh, hello? 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 Right I want to get yeah. back to that teacher's we Go to this lady. Hello. Uh, <laughs> hello. Yeah. There's okay. a mic in the back. Go ahead. Hello, Charles McCullough, Embassy of Australia. Uh, since Sec Secretary Duncan convened the first international teaching summit uh, for the teaching profession in March of this year, there's been a larger focus on the multiplicity of teaching reforms happening in other countries, not just looking at what the latest PISA findings are. I know in Australia, we've been, uh, just launched our own teaching standards and principal standards and integrate those into PD. But I'm wondering, can anyone on the panel speak to teacher evaluation systems in other countries which may help to inform policymakers or evaluation system designers here in the United States. Thank Linda's you. Linda's done work in that area. Uh, Thank you. I'm glad you brought up the international context. I just got back from Finland, uh, which makes you want to eat your heart out, really, when you see the way they support teachers and kids in schools. Um, and you know, there, there's so much emphasis on investing in uh, the knowledge base and the expertise of teachers before they come into the profession in their you know master's degree programs that they take in teacher training schools connected to universities etc um, that uh, the reflective capacity of teachers to be uh, able to continue to improve their own practice and improve their uh, colleagues' practice is kind of built into that process. And I think one of the things we need to be thinking about is that uh, we put almost no resources into teacher training on the front end. Um, we don't support the programs to get better. We don't support the uh, teachers to be able to take uh, advantage of good programs. Uh, and we can't fire our way to Finland. 
We can't just say we're going to get rid of uh, teachers. Patrick said mediocrity was the problem. Uh, that's not because any teachers want to be mediocre. It's because we deny access to knowledge and skills to teachers through our whole set of policies that neglect that part of the process. But Singapore is a better example of the teacher evaluation process that we're talking about here after people are in the classroom. Uh, principals and lead and mentor teachers who are part of a career ladder there are all part of uh, an evaluation process. It's regular, it gives continuous feedback, much like uh, the teacher advancement program and some others that have been mentioned here. It focuses on can you teach the whole child uh, mentally, spiritually, cognitively, uh, physically, ethically. I mean, it's got a very broad view. It looks at whether teachers uh, use uh, expert practices in the classroom. Uh, it looks at evidence of student learning that is classroom-based. It does not use test scores. Uh, it looks at leadership capacity and develops teachers as leaders and puts them on the path towards other career growth. And it looks especially at whether teachers collaborate well together and contribute to the improvement of the entire school. And there's a lot of evidence that teachers' collective action in teams and in school-wide improvement has a bigger influence on school, uh, on, on student achievement gains than any individual teachers. So they emphasize teachers as a member of a collective um, in the evaluation process. So I do think that we can look uh, abroad. When uh, Singapore was represented at that International Teacher Summit, the minister was very clear to say, we do not rank teachers. Uh, we do not rank them against each other. We don't use um, test score data to do that. We think it would be counterproductive. Uh, but we do pay a lot of attention to what's going on in the classroom for individual teachers and how they work collaboratively with each other. And of course, Singapore and Finland are two of the highest scoring jurisdictions in the world. I read a McKinsey company report that said that Singapore only takes teachers from the top third of college graduates. And that in the United States it's 23%, and in poor schools it's a lower percentage. And so we're drawing from a different uh, student body, I think. Can I say something about sure. that? Because there's conventional wisdom that comes around. Singapore's statistic was that they take from the top third of the high school class. Uh, in the United States, um, ETS did some studies about the test scores of people who actually make it all the way through a teacher ed program and go into the field. Uh, it, most teachers come from the top half of the college class. The top half of, and the college class is about the top half of the high school class. So most teachers, particularly secondary teachers, come from the top quarter of their high school class as compared to the top third in Singapore. Now, you could also say that their high school students, you know, do better on international assessments on average than ours do, especially in math. But uh, there's, uh, I think, misinformation about the ability level of the American teaching force, which comes about in part because some studies look at who says in high school they'd like to be a teacher based on their SAT scores, not who actually gets into a preparation program, gets out of a preparation program, passes the licensing test. And there aren't as big a difference but in the capacities of American teachers with respect to international teachers as one might think from some of the rhetoric that um, circulates. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, good morning. My name is Mary Beth Klotz, and I'm representing the National Association of School Psychologists. And my question is, um, I would like to ask the panel if, if anyone would um, express an opinion or have a comment about applying these value-added measures to specialized instructional support personnel, such as school psychologists, school social workers, school counselors. There are some states that are already doing this, so um, I, we'd, I'd appreciate hearing a comment on that. Thank you. Yes, sir. I mean, I don't know anything about the details, but it strikes me as a pretty terrible idea. Um, <laughs> for one thing, for one thing, the idea that the main goal of a school psychologist is to raise students' test scores just strikes me as misguided. A lot of a lot of what schools produce is not reading and math test scores, and a lot of what we want schools to produce is not reading and math test scores. And it seems quite likely to me that, that the main things that the school psychologist is accomplishing are not reading and math test scores. 
And if we start evaluating them based on reading and math test scores, they're going to start working on reading and math test scores and ignoring everything else. Another question? Go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Ryan Miller. I'm a doctoral candidate at Florida State University in public policy. And my question uh, actually stems from a comment. The thermometer analogy that was given uh, I found to be interesting, but it sounds like the concern of the panel is more not when the thermometer reads 101.7 versus 101.2, but 101.7 and 96.9. Um, my question then stems from that. Could the use of confidence intervals rather than the, the point estimates for the teacher, how would that uh, impact the validity of, of these measures in a teacher accountability system? Uh, one study that I don't think we talked about that Sean Corcoran did in New York City looked at what the confidence interval is around uh, a teacher's value-added score. And his uh, one, a, a quick summary of what he found is that a teacher who's sort of at the 43rd percentile, kind of in the average range on a value-added effectiveness score using the model that's being used in New York City, um, actually has an actual score somewhere between the 15th percentile and the 75th percentile. So the confidence interval uh, is, you know, I mean, the band is extremely large. That the, and, and the bouncing around that we were talking about when, when Audrey was giving examples of individual teachers, you're right, it's not between 101.7 and 101.2. It's between sort of, you know, uh, two standard deviations above the mean to one standard deviation below the mean to back up to another standard deviation. I mean, it's, it's huge variability uh, from year to year that, that the uh, examples that uh, were being given suggest. So thank, thank you for... I think Ed has a comment to add. Uh, in interesting question and a good concept. Uh, you'll recall I drew a distinction between bias and precision. By Imprecision is the, the sort of random inaccuracy, the noise. That's what we could do a good job of getting at using confidence intervals. And if we just use more data, the confidence interval will shrink. But the more serious concern is bias, the fact that there's factors that aren't really random that are going to lean against uh, one teacher or for another that cut across students, across classes. Uh, interestingly, that problem is even worse at the school level than it is at the, at the teacher level, since that's another use of these models that's being considered and hasn't been talked about. Uh, Intuition would be that with the larger samples at the school level, these models work, would, might work better because the confidence intervals would be smaller. But in fact, the, uh, and I'm going to get technical for just a second since you're a city or doctoral candidate, uh, the way that the value-added models identify the teacher effects is through the mixing of students as they're assigned to one teacher after another after another across years. Uh, the way that these value-added models would identify school-level effects would be that schools, teachers, kids would have to move from school to school over the years. In fact, there is a fair amount of student mobility, but usually when students change schools, they move into other schools that are about like the schools that they've left with respect to socioeconomic status and so forth. As a result, there's really much less mixing at the school level than there is at the teacher level, and the bias problems are at least as severe for school level uses of these models, even though the precision looks better. This lady deserves an opportunity given her persistence. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shelley Hines. I teach physics and astronomy at the Louisiana School for Math, Science, and the Arts, and I'm an Albert Einstein Fellow. And my question has to do with student evaluations. Can you elaborate on how student evaluations can be fairly and effectively incorporated into teacher evaluations and how much weight they should be given? And this is kind of related to the idea of turning teacher preparation upside down, which to me implies uh, a more college professor preparation. And college professors are evaluated heavily on student evaluations. Thank you. Ed? Um, this is something, uh, years ago, my first serious foray into teacher evaluation was back in the late 80s when I was working with Lee Shulman on some of the pilots that led later on to the National Board uh, evaluations, at least the, the earlier versions before the whole system went to ETS. We looked at high school students' evaluations of, of sample teaching as a source of possible information. Out of that, the conclusion that I came to is that Students at, at the high school level are not terribly well positioned to be able to make sense of whether the teaching is good or bad. 
I think at the elementary school level, it would be even less so. College students have much a better perspective because they've had uh, uh, more years of experience moving from classroom to classroom and having a larger set of teachers that they com can compare to each other. But if I think about, uh, say, a fourth or fifth grader trying to evaluate his or her own teacher, I, I'm not sure what, whether the sources of information that are going to go into that evaluation are going to be the right ones for a more a sort of adult interpretation. Clearly, if all the children in the classroom are very unhappy, that's a problem. Uh, but that's something we should be able to get at in other ways. It might be better to focus on getting student input through measures of classroom climate, uh, having kids answer questions about whether they feel comfortable asking questions, whether the kids in this classroom all learn together, whether there are opportunities to cooperate, whether they understand what the purpose of the schooling is, and so on. In our responses to those more kinds of those kinds of questions, we might get better information to factor into the teacher evaluation. Yes. And I Oh, I'm sorry. And I think that that is something that's forthcoming across states as they tr the policy trickles down and they're trying to negotiate how this works. I know of a, a couple of states that are looking at student evaluations, given the issues, especially with early childhood evaluations of their teachers, but they're also looking at parent evaluations of teachers and also what's called 360 evaluations. They're using those with administrators. And so the teachers are now evaluating, well, in some in pilot pro projects right now, the teachers evaluating the administrators, administrators' peers evaluating the administrators, and then the supervisors. So 360 evaluations are coming forth too. But it's again to add that all the indicators have issues themselves, but when you put it all together theoretically, if they match, then you have a better capturing of the construct. Let me use the student evaluations to emphasize two of the points I made. One is the Campbell's Law point. When I was a 13-year-old, I knew pretty well which teachers I liked and didn't like, and if you'd asked me, I probably would have told you. On the other hand, if you'd told me that the teachers were going to be fired or paid based on that, I, I'm sure I would have gotten a lot less homework that year. I would have, you know, the teachers are, if the teachers need to get good evaluations, you don't want to ask adolescents to, to give them control over their teachers' careers unless you really want the teachers to be kowtowing to those adolescents, which probably isn't what we want the teachers to be doing. A second thing related to that gets at the short-term versus long-term. In retrospect, some of the teachers who I liked the most, I think probably weren't all that effective. They were a lot of fun to have as teachers. I would have given them very high evaluations, but I don't know that I learned a whole lot in their classes. And there were teachers who I didn't really like because they worked me too hard who probably were very effective. And I think, again, the short-term measures, we've got to be very careful about them because it's not clear that they correspond very, very well to what, who's producing long-term benefits. We have five more minutes, so unfortunately, we can only have a couple more questions. I have a question. Go ahead. I have a question. Hi, I'm David Schlein. I'm an economist at the National Education Association. Given the reality that um, throughout states we are seeing that 50% threshold, not just in Florida and the DC, but spreading like wildfire. And even some of the evaluation programs that you seem to like, like TAP, have a, v a value added component of at least 25%. What suggestions, practical suggestions, would you suggest be included in programs as safeguards? Anything that we negotiate or we try to advocate for as appropriate safeguards um, to ameliorate the bad things that come from value added? Well, I think they, uh, the panel talked about this earlier about multiple measures and not having one measure trump another measure. Uh, anything you care to add to that, Ed? Uh, robust appeals process, ways of uh, combining evidence that aren't locked into some very mechanistic formula. Uh, so that information can be evaluated, evaluated in context. Uh, alternative routes to acceptable evaluation for teachers. I guess I would add one other thing, which is that we've talked about the alternative to, to value-added type estimates being giving, letting the principal be in charge. But I think it's unrealistic for the principal to be actually the person doing this. Um, principal's got 30 or 40 teachers and has a lot of other responsibilities other than teacher evaluation. And so. One important, I think, safeguard is to make sure that the, there are real resources available to do this job. You can't just, you can't expect somebody to evaluate well in a couple of hours a week. So somebody, they, the person doing it needs to be trained and they need to, they need to have time to do it. In this lady? Well, going to go with Education Daily, he kind of stole my question. Um, but I'm wondering, are there examples, I know Linda, you mentioned TAP. Um, 
that do a good job of um, doing the kind of things you were talking about, being nuanced and factoring the student learning at the classroom level, like you said, in single four, if you have any examples of, of those. There, there are a lot of interesting examples. One of the reasons I mentioned TAP is because they are observations of teachers, which uh, they've surveyed teachers about and teachers find very helpful, are you know, based on this standards-based practice tool. Uh, evaluators are well-trained. There's a lot of opportunity for feedback. They have collaborative time for teachers to plan with each other and get uh, professional development and, and peer observations to improve their practice. All of those things, uh, large numbers of teachers in those systems say it's really helpful to me. Um, most of the survey data suggests they're less um, excited about the uh, value-added component of it, but they're willing to tolerate that because it's integrated in with this really good stuff that helps them improve their practice. And so I think that you know, that model of being sure that there's a lot of feedback about practice uh, and evidence of student learning that is integrated is, is important. Arizona has had a career ladder program for a number of years that has had teachers collecting evidence of student learning as part of what is the evidence presented about their practice. And they found that as teachers have looked at classroom evidence of what the essays looked like at the beginning of the year and what the essays looked like at the end of the year and what the you know, math knowledge and so on, that they've gotten better at evaluating students. That's improved their practice and they've produced a lot of good evidence about student learning in the context of the teacher evaluation system that also includes evaluation of practice. In New Mexico, there's a three-tier career ladder that involves standards-based evaluations of practice that includes student learning evidence um, that is modeled after the kind of assessment of the National Board, but it's done at the beginning of the career, um, at the point of the professional license, and later on for advancement. So there are a lot of interesting examples of thoughtful evaluation practices going on around the country, and I think it would be helpful to raise those up for further analysis and scrutiny as we try to figure out how to move forward. The point that's been made over and over again, that principals need more training, need more time, need to have be augmented in the time they can bring by expert teachers who share some of the, um, uh, the load of uh, observing and supporting the improvement of practice is a point that should not get lost here. Uh, because at the end of the day, that's actually the problem that we're trying to solve, is that that model has not worked for many, many years. Well, unfortunately, we have to come to an end, and I know there's a lot of questions, and the panel will be here. So let me, first of all, thank you for your attendance and for your good questions. Uh, I think the number of people here shows the in interest in the area. I also want to thank the uh, National Academy of Education and AERA for sponsoring this. You picked a very good topic. But lastly, I want to thank the panel because you showed deep knowledge, but you also were able to explain yourself in terms that should have an effect on policy. At least we hope so. So thank you very much.